Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed tea and had an opportunity to chit chat with some of your colleagues and perhaps made some new friends um, here this morning. Um, we did have about 150 people, registrants, but the turnout today has been about 80, 85. So, but it doesn't look so much because this is such a, <laughs> a huge auditorium. But thank you for staying on with us um, for the second segment. I'd now like to introduce the chair of the second session of today's workshop. Uh, it's Professor Julian Savalescu, who is the Chen Su Lan Centennial Professor in Medical Ethics and also the Director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics at NUS. Please join me in introducing Julian. Welcoming and welcoming, Julian. Okay, th thanks, Sumi. I'll be um, blessedly brief. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Bridget Williams, uh, a public health physician. Uh, and who is currently doing a, a doctorate uh, with me and others on dual use um, in medicine. But she uh, led producing a, a really excellent report on challenge studies for the UK RI pandemic accelerator that Josh Morrison was involved with, as well as other researchers in the UK. Um, Bridget is um, unfortunately in the US and won't be able to join us for the, uh, for the Q&A because it's, it's very late there. Um, so, but she has agreed to um, present the first one virtually. So over to you, Bridget. Okay, great. Um, thanks very much, Julian. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me, and I'm assuming if that's not the case, someone will probably tell me, so I'll just go ahead. Um, but I'll start by sharing my screen. So hopefully the slides should be up now. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, Julian, and thank you to all the organizers for the invitation to um, speak today. Um, yeah, and unfortunately I can't be in Singapore. Um, I would like to be, sounds great, but uh, I'm very happy to be able to speak to you all. So today I'm going to be talking um, a little bit about the report that Julian just mentioned, um, which uh, was done in collaboration with Josh Morrison from One Day Sooner, um, Dominic Wilkinson and Julian, um, uh, both from the New Hero Centre, and Julian now obviously uh, with you all in, in Singapore. Um, so this report was um, aiming to investigate the ethical challenges or the ethical issues that come up with challenge studies with pathogens with pandemic potential in particular. Um, and as part of that, uh, one of the, um, I guess, uh, kind of features of it was that we spoke to some people who were involved in COVID-19 challenge studies. So a lot of the um, work around this report uh, was related to conducting challenge studies with COVID-19. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the barriers and challenges that came up um, uh, as we developed this report. Okay, so... Here is the uh, first page of the report, and um, if you want the, it's up in full on the One Day Sooner website. Um, if you're interested in looking at this a little bit more, so to develop this report, we first of all looked at the existing ethical guidance, um, including existing ethical frameworks for considering uh, the uh, the ethics of challenge studies um, uh, in general. Uh, we then spoke to um, experts and uh, people who are involved in making decisions around challenge studies, um, including several people who are involved in decision making around COVID-19 challenge studies in the UK, uh, and then went through a process of ethical analysis um, to develop a decision making framework and also a set of recommendations. So I'll just briefly talk about the decision-making framework that we come up with, and I'll touch on the recommendations later. Um, so the content of this framework does overlap a lot with uh, some of the existing ethical frameworks looking at challenge studies out there, including the WHO report, which was on the previous slide. However, I think something that is unique about our framework is that we um, have this uh, two, um, uh, two factored structure or two question structure to our framework. So we're separating, I guess, it, the way to think about the considerations into these two components. So the first is asking the question, is the study in the public interest? And the second is, um, does the study satisfy other ethical requirements? Um, and I'm, I guess, pointing this out because uh, this came about through considering um, the ethical challenges that came up uh, in conducting COVID-19 challenge studies. So what were those challenges? Um, so, in speaking to the people who were involved in these decisions, there was uh, three factors that seemed to be, I guess, most prominent, uh, uh, came up most frequently as major challenges. Um, one was perhaps unsurprisingly um, uncertainty. 
Another was resource scarcity. And finally, uh, the urgency. So I think it is true that all of these three factors are relevant to uh, a wide range of medical research and um, most challenge studies as well. So even with diseases that are fairly well studied, uh, studied there's always an element of uncertainty um, in how things will go. Um, we live in a, a world with finite resources, so there's always going to be some resource scarcity and uh, decisions need to be made about how to make priorities in research. Um, and finally, I even though it's the status quo, um, well, unfortunately, the status quo is that uh, millions of people do die from infectious diseases each year. So even though it might not feel like an emergency, um, there, there is also a sense of urgency, I guess, in uh, everyday research. But having said all of that, I do think that these three factors were much more pronounced in the COVID-19 uh, setting and um, uh, were, I guess, uh, a greater challenge for thinking about the ethics of challenge studies in, in this setting. So to go through them all, uncertainty, obviously with a novel pathogen, there's a lot of uncertainty in the, um, the effects of the pathogen and uh, in particular, the longer term effects. Um, we're still learning about long COVID and what COVID infection does to the body. Um, but another element of uncertainty that's relevant here is the uncertainty in the risk profile. Um, so uh, with COVID, relatively quickly, we were able to identify some factors that were associated with um, higher risk, but uh, it was a little, there was still a lot of uncertainties about exactly who is at high risk, who is at highest risk of severe disease or long-term consequences, um, and who's at lowest risk, which is obviously important for thinking about uh, conducting challenge studies. And then another important element of uncertainty is the uncertainty in the effects on um, population health more broadly. So, uh, there are obviously major uncertainties in um, what the benefits will be of challenge studies, particularly in this setting. Um, but something that came up a lot in our interviews was the fact that uh, the benefits of COVID-19 challenge studies would, to a large extent, be determined by um, decisions made by governments. So the non-pharmaceutical interventions that they choose to put in place and how they choose to run those policies, um, and also the choices around um, approval and rollout of vaccines and the timing of that. Uh, those would be things that would influence the, the potential benefits of any uh, COVID-19 challenge studies. Um, and similarly, the benefits also depend on what else is happening in the research landscape. So uh, the value of answering certain research questions with a COVID-19 challenge study would be at least somewhat dependent on uh, whether those questions were being answered elsewhere. Um, there are also some important uncertainty, uncertainties in thinking about the risks of um, COVID-19 challenge studies. So one of the, um, I guess, major objections that was raised against COVID-19 challenge studies was the concern that um, either the studies themselves or incidents, uh, adverse effects that might occur in the study could cause a reduction in public trust in uh, research institutions, science more generally, and vaccines in particular. Um, if this, and if this were to be the case, then there could be uh, a lower uptake of vaccinations and which would have um, uh, pretty negative uh, population health effects. However, some people in response to that say that the uncertainty cuts both ways and it could have been the case or could be the case that uh, challenge studies that showed the effectiveness vaccine, of vaccines in a very, um, I guess, easy to understand way or um, in a very, um, uh, I guess, obvious way uh, could actually lead to improved uh, public perception of vaccines. So there's just a lot of uncertainty in thinking about the effects. In terms of resource scarcity, in some ways, the COVID-19 research landscape uh, was one of the uh, medical research landscapes with the least resource scarcity. Um, many governments realised the importance of uh, conducting research to be able to improve the response. And so uh, we're able to uh, find a lot of funding to fund research. Um, however, there are some things that money can't buy. And some of the things that were, well, some of the resource scarcities that were most important in the COVID-19 setting were the scarcity of laboratory and clinical resources, which unfortunately, even with a lot of money, can't be scaled up um, rapidly. So when thinking about challenge studies, an important um, component of developing the challenge study is creating the challenge agent that's actually used to uh, bring about infection. But the lab laboratories that can create that agent were also being used to um, do other tasks for uh, producing products for other research projects um, or conducting testing or developing antibodies and other treatments. Um, so using laboratory resources for challenge studies would uh, potentially mean that um, other activities were displaced. 
And similarly, with clinical resources, obviously challenge studies require uh, doctors, nurses and clinical care facilities, um, which were already uh, being um, extended beyond their capacity in many settings in the world, including the UK um, during COVID. Um, and then finally, uh, urgency is particularly important, was particularly important in the COVID setting and is probably going to be important in, or in pandemic settings in the future. Um, probably don't need to uh, harp on about this for this ground, but uh, when there is an exponentially growing pathogen, uh, interventions that come uh, sooner can have a, a dramatic difference on the ultimate effects, both in terms of the direct health effects of the disease in morbidity and mortality, but also the indirect effects um, of shutting society down to control the infection. Um, and we're still learning about the negative effects of um, some of these uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, so something that didn't come up uh, specifically in the interviews, but seemed to be underlying a lot of the comments of um, our interviewees and seems related to all of these three factors, um, is the fact that in the COVID-19 uh, setting, the, the number of and variety of stakeholders was much larger than it was in other settings or, or is normally when thinking about challenge studies. So in COVID-19, almost everybody in the world was affected um, and uh, so almost everybody had uh, a stake in what research was being, research was being conducted around COVID-19, um, which is different to, um, I guess, what happens normally with challenge studies. So I think these factors taken together, uncertainty, resource scarcity, urgency, and this um, much larger number and variety of uh, stakeholders, suggests that there's a really uh, important greater need for coordination in this setting and there was in the COVID-19 setting. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, understanding the, the benefits to be able to make a, a risk benefit assessment of um, challenge studies requires input from government and other researchers. Uh, there's a need to ensure appropriate allocation of laboratory and clinical resources. Um, and a need to coordinate to be able to act more quickly um, and to, to wrangle all the stakeholders. And I guess going back to this framework, um, I think where this comes in most is in this first question around, is the study in the public interest? Um, because one of the things that kind of came out of the, the interviews was this idea that there, are, that there are a lot of stakeholders who um, are relevant to being able to make this assessment about if the study is in the public interest and particularly if um, the expected benefits of the study um, justify the expected harms. So normally, at least in the UK, um, the Research Ethics Committee that's reviewing a study will make an assessment about whether the study seems justified um, given the uh, risks, or sorry, whether the benefits to the study, uh, benefits of the study seem to justify the risks to the participants. Um, however, in the setting of COVID-19 and probably in the setting of um, future pandemics, uh, this is a question which probably can't be answered just by the Research Ethics Committee. So there's need for ways to have um, other stakeholders having input onto this question and potentially even um, having different bodies that uh, answer this question who um, either uh, are somewhat distinct to the Research Ethics Committee who might be um, better able to handle the second part of the assessment, which is looking at, you know, once you've decided that it is appropriate to do some kind of study, um, are, how, did the, how does it satisfy the other ethical requirements that we're concerned about? Um, so to me, I think that uh, the special challenges for COVID-19 challenge studies as opposed to um, other challenge studies. Uh, the most important thing seems to be this greater need for coordination and how that changes the decision-making process. Um, but there are a couple of other things which I think are worth mentioning. So one is that the uncertainty, particularly the uncertainty in the risk benefit profile for participants creates uh, issues for um, considering informed consent. So some of the interviewees we spoke to um, questioned the idea that you could have informed consent when there was so much uncertainty in the risk profile. However, other people thought that as long as that uncertainty was communicated to uh, potential participants, then um, in, in, in consent could be considered appropriately informed. Um, however, they also noted that uh, in general, humans are pretty bad at thinking about probabilities um, and, and risks. So that in these situations where there is a lot of uncertainty in the potentially uh, high consequence pathogens and, and potentially high risk. Um, it may it's probably appropriate to have special uh, consent procedures that um, uh, help to ensure that people are understanding the probabilities um, in a satisfactory way. 
Um, and then the consideration of resource scarcity and urgency also lends, uh, I guess, creates some consequences for the way that um, challenge studies methodologies is considered. Um, and in particular, um, uh, one of the things that, uh, another thing that came out of the interviews, which I thought was interesting, was that the, the rate limiting step for many challenge studies was the production of um, the challenge agent. So uh, normally it takes um, at least several months to produce enough challenge agent to conduct a study. And I'm sure there's people speaking at this event who know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but so being able to uh, speed up that process if possible, um, or think about um, alternatives to that process, such as human to human transmission studies, um, it would be another kind of important uh, consequence of thinking about the differences between or the special challenges that arise in that arose in COVID nineteen. Um, I guess related to this, uh, one of the reasons that um, challenge agent production can be slowed down a little bit is the requirement for the agent to be produced to good manufacturing product standards or GMP standards. So a question to ask is whether there would be some situations where it might be appropriate to relax the standards for the challenge agent to allow it to be produced more quickly. Um, and just quickly, I'll go over the recommendations that we made in this report because they were very much informed by um, these, these challenges that arise, particularly in the setting with pandemic pathogens. So the first is about creating a mechanism to answer that first part of our framework um, of when a challenge study is in the public interest. And we suggest some actions that can be taken uh, and that we think should be taken now to be able to have a process in place uh, should this arise again in the future, rather than having a situation where people are needing to make um, very difficult decisions uh, in a time sensitive and um, you know, somewhat chaotic uh, situation. Um, the second recommendation was to establish procedures to streamline the ethics review of challenge studies. And one of the, the points that we make is around developing informed consent procedures to deal with the uncertainty in risk profiles and, and communicating that. And then finally, the third recommendation was around developing and maintaining the infrastructure and expertise required to conduct um, high quality challenge studies efficiently. Um, and uh, we specifically mentioned the I think the benefits from investigating ways to accelerate challenge agent production or potential alternatives. So I think I'm over time a little bit. So just to sum up, uh, these were the challenges that arose in, um, uh, I guess, thinking about and conducting challenge COVID-19 challenge studies from the interviews that we conducted for this uh, report. And it was uncertainty, resource scarcity, urgency, and um, the greater number of stakeholders involved. And then the consequences of these challenges seem to suggest a greater need for coordination, um, potentially special consideration for consent, uh, and also methodological considerations, particularly around um, the process of challenge agent production. And I'll stop there. I just want to acknowledge the many people that um, had input into this report. Uh, and just, I guess I'll leave it there. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, so our next, and our next speaker is um, Associate Professor Barney Young, who I'm sure is known to many of you and who is uh, in charge of Singapore's um, COVID-19 challenge study. So, so Barney, over to you. Just waiting for the screen to catch up. So, so I'm going to talk about COVID-19 challenge studies. Um, so I guess moving a little bit from um, a broad and um, general overview about um, challenge studies uh, or the ethics of challenge studies um, to looking not just specifically at COVID ones, but at one that we're planning to conduct in Singapore and in the context that we are now. Um, so this is moving on from perhaps what Bridget was discussing from that early pandemic context to thinking about it now when I'm sure we're all vaccinated, we've all been affected at least once with COVID as well. So things are very different now from when those discussions were happening um, back in 2020. So to give some background, um, so controlled human infection studies are in their infancy in Asia. 
Um, there is not many modern type of uh, human infection studies which have been conducted in the region. Uh, in Singapore specifically, there was plans for an influenza challenge study, uh, which uh, Shabana was involved in back in 2016. It, it was funded, there was ethics approval, but um, it was not able to proceed with uh, re recruitment, so that, that study was abandoned. Regionally, um, human challenge studies have been conducted in Thailand, um, both with malaria, with Vivax malaria, um, and seronegative dengue challenge studies. Um, those are both currently actually underway in Thailand at the moment. And then in 2023, uh, so started discussions with the UK team who conducted the first human challenge study with SARS-CoV-2. Um, um, and in 2023, we obtained funding to conduct a SARS-CoV-2 human challenge study um, in Singapore. And uh, the aims of this study, uh, and we'll go into some detail about how we'll actually be conducting it. The aims of this study are um, scientific. So we want to study the uh, viral kinetics and the immune response to infection, um, develop the capacity or the capability to conduct um, further human challenge studies in Singapore, uh, and eventually lead on to doing a study um, with, um, to develop vaccines or help develop vaccines or, or therapeutics. Um, this has been mentioned several times, but the, uh, the May 2020 working group report about SARS-CoV-2 human challenge studies um, which uh, set out some of the um, some ethical guidelines. Um, I just put this summary here as well, which I think ties in somewhat with the earlier talks from Jerry. Um, in terms of these were eight criteria for conducting SARS-CoV-2 challenge studies. Obviously, this is a summary of the recommendations, but there's really nothing special there. Really, what what is listed is the what may be considered for any. Um, clinical research, um, and particularly any clinical research involving healthy volunteers, as proposed to, say, a later phase study where you're investigating a treatment for someone who already has an illness um, or, a, or a vaccine, for example. Um, this framework is being updated uh, and thinking then perhaps to a higher risk type situation, which is moving from um, what was on the hoof development of an ethical framework perhaps for conducting human challenge studies to preparing us for future pandemics and thinking about human challenge studies as part of the pandemic preparedness, as part of that immediate pandemic response. Um, and this, uh, actually the, this um, framework being developed by WHO, the comments closed last night um, on it, but this was their summary of the key criteria. There's actually seven, but I just highlighted the top five here where there is some differences from what um, was presented in that initial 2020 report. Um, and, and really what they just talk, talk about is um, thinking about human challenge studies in terms of the emergency response and so where um, there is an urgency and where there may be a time pressure as well. Um, but again, not specifically um, different really from any clinical research which might be conducted when there is uncertainty um, about the infection or uncertainty about the pathogen um, and where there is uh, a emerging data and therefore a need to gather that um, and, uh, and respond to it. Thinking about some specific challenges with related, as they relate to human challenge studies. I've just put in this summary here from this narrative review, um, which I think is good. And I'm just going to talk through a few of the things on the left side, which are some human challenge specific ethical questions and how they are being addressed through the, um, or how we're responding to them in, the, in our COVID human challenge study. Um, so it's been discussed before, there's what does the right to withdraw mean if somebody has been infected? Um, or has been challenged with an agent, um, how can someone then withdraw subsequently? And in the Singapore context, there is an Infectious Diseases Act, um, which gives a lot of power to um, the Ministry of Health to detain people um, who may be infected um, with a um, pathogen um, where there is public health concern. Um, and that, particularly early in the pandemic, may be quite challenging um, for conducting a human challenge study. Um, right now, it's less complicated um, because we've moved on and everybody's been infected um, with COVID or has been vaccinated. 
um, and because we have the availability of antivirals, which are expected to reduce transmission. Um, so we um, will be informing our participants that if they decide to withdraw from the study after being inoculated, that we will need to inform the Ministry of Health. Um, but informal discussions with them is that they would not expect that there would be um, a need to detain the individual if they did decide to withdraw. Um, something that might have happened if we had conducted the human change study back in 2021. Um, second one, how should researchers communicate with different stakeholders? Um, so thinking about this from a community perspective, um, we have conducted a um, research, a uh, survey um, to understand people's ideas about human challenge studies and with COVID challenge studies and how much they should be reimbursed. Um, and that will be discussed in more detail in the talk after mine by uh, Sam Sin Ray. Um, and then what are the appropriate standards for informed consent and ethical review? Um, and this goes back to what has been discussed previously about communicating uncertainty um, when there may be unknown risks um, and how do we um, inform participants about that and how, do we, how are we comfortable that participants understand what's going on um, when they take part in a human challenge studies, uh, human challenge study. We have no uh, um, additional steps to our informed consent process um, for the human challenge study, which has been approved by the uh, IRB. Um, so people will be signing a consent form in the presence of a witness as prescribed by the regulations. And um, we don't have any additional um, quiz afterwards. We don't record the consent process, which is what has been also done previously. Um, and I think that, that reflects that we're in a very different place with COVID now. Um, from the point of view of the human challenge study, I think we're in a very good place for doing a COVID challenge study. There is clearly still an urgency um, or a need for a challenge study uh, and a need with respect to COVID to develop better vaccines uh, and antivirals. But almost everybody has an experience of being infected. Um, and we expect everyone who joins the study would also have an experience of being infected previously. And that could be that's quite different from what happens with other um, phase one research um, in healthy volunteers who will be exposed to something which they may have, or which they're unlikely to have any previous experience of. So moving on specifically then to that first study, so it's called COVID-001. This was the first SARS-CoV-2 human challenge study conducted by Prof. Chris Chu and team um, in London. Um, so I'll go through some of the details here. Uh, they enrolled 36 people aged 18 to 29 years. They were people who had no evidence of previous infection, had not been vaccinated against uh, SARS-CoV-2 previously. And this was a dose escalation study in which they started with the lowest potential, the lowest dose, with plans to then escalate to higher doses with uh, achieving an attack rate of more than 50%, or between 50 to 70% was the aim. Um, they were able to achieve that attack rate with the lowest infectious dose, T uh, TCID 50 of 10. Um, and this is using the wild type ancestral virus. Um, it is not attenuated. It was a clinical sample, um, which as discussed previously, was then uh, cultured under GMP conditions um, to make sure it's clean and stable. Um, after inoculation, participants were housed in a high containment quarantine unit um, with continuous medical monitoring and so on. Um, and um, they, uh, 18 participants became infected, which gave that uh, infection rate of 53% um, because two of that 38 um, had to be, or two of the 36 uh, volunteers were withdrawn subsequently um, as they had uh, seroconverted prior to inoculation. Um, and finally, there were no serious adverse events from this study. Um, mild to moderate symptoms were reported by most participants, 11 were asymptomatic, um, and they have very detailed information then about the symptoms, their time course, um, which I'll go into in a little bit. There was a lot of interest in this study when it started in the UK. Um, so this is the, the summary from their paper. Almost 30,000 individuals registered their interest online to participate. Um, they contacted 6,000 uh, and about 200 were then subsequently brought in for eligibility assessment. Uh, and then as mentioned, 36 were then inoculated as well. Um, on the right is just a very quick summary of the whole uh, journey that a participant um, went, on to, went on from screening to admission to a quarantine unit, inoculation, um, staying in quarantine until they were confirmed to be 
um, not infectious, um, and then the follow-up afterwards. And I'll go into a bit more detail of that um, for our study specifically. And then this is the type of data which they obtained. So this is an overview of the symptomology um, from the human change study. Um, so on the left is a chart of the different symptoms, the symptom scores that participants experienced, uh, and particularly the smell score. Um, there was some reduction in um, smell which persisted beyond day 28 in some participants. Um, there were no other um, uh, symptoms or indication of long COVID. Um, and then right was uh, the proportion of infected subjects based on uh, the types of symptoms that um, participants experienced with the different colors based on the intensity of those symptoms. And I'm not going to go through, there's several papers which they have published now. This is a unique study, can never be repeated because there are no seronegative people which uh, could be infected nowadays. Um, but this is the type of data which they're able to produce. Um, and as Shabana mentioned very, uh, at the beginning, the unique and the, the really special thing about human challenge studies is you know exactly when somebody was infected and you know exactly how much they were infected by um, of the challenge agent. And so then you can produce very detailed and very accurate assessments of, for example, the viral kinetics, um, the immune response, and so on. And this here looks at the viral kinetics and um, uh, uh, understanding the exact pattern of um, viral load increases um, and comparing it between different sites, um, here mainly the nose and throat. Um, they have other papers which then look at um, environmental contamination uh, and release of aerosolized virus. Okay, and so then where this study fits in the context of all SARS-CoV-2 human challenge studies which are done, ongoing, and planned. Uh, so on the left, there are two uh, challenge studies which have been conducted with an ancestral virus. Um, so COVID-01, the first one, which is the one I've just gone through. COVID-CHIM01 uh, was conducted by um, Helen McShane and her team in Oxford. Um, and that was conducted in seropositive individuals, those who had either been vaccinated or infected previously. Um, that study is ongoing, um, uh, but uh, they had difficulty achieving infection um, uh, in this group. Then there is the Delta studies, which is where Singapore will come in. So we have COVID-002. This is ongoing in the UK at the moment. Uh, it's very similar in design to COVID-001 and COVID-CHIM-01. Um, and uh, it is a dose, uh, initially a dose escalation and uh, characterization study um, in which volunteers are being inoculated with Delta. Um, and that, uh, there are two steps to it. First is titrating up the dose to achieve the attack rate of 50 to 70%, and then looking at what um, volunteer conditions are necessary to achieve that attack rate, um, for example, as has been used for several other challenge studies, whether there needs to be a antibody level below a certain threshold within which infection can be established. The Sinkov study in Singapore um, will be with the Delta variant. Similar to Ancestral, that Delta variant is GMP produced and is from a clinical sample, not an attenuated virus. Um, and we will be replicating the conditions established in COVID-002 in Singapore. Um, and um, as I said initially, the aim of this is to um, both study the scientific outcomes from um, challenging participants in Singapore um, and also to establish the capacity to do challenge studies um, in order to do future studies, such as the Omicron ones, which are planned. So um, Omicron studies, um, there is plans to conduct a um, challenge study, which will be initially a dose escalation, then characterization um, with a Omicron variant. And then that will also progress to a clinical trial, um, which is finally really where we want to get with these challenge studies, um, which is using them to test the efficacy um, of different vaccines. And recently, um, CEPI um, has um, awarded funding to Imperial College, of which we're a partner institute as well. Um, so $57 million um, to conduct a um, COVID challenge study with Omicron um, with, with the aim of studying a vaccine that can block transmission. And this is partially where COVID challenge studies now are so important. Um, the, the vaccines which are currently in use 
there's no real need to do a challenge study. Even though they're quite rubbish at protecting you against infection, um, we, the main way in which they establish protection is through antibody levels. And we can measure that in the blood. We can measure T cells or whatever else in the blood. Um, and, but what these vaccines don't do, they protect very well against severe illness, but they don't protect so well against transmission, particularly with Omicron. Um, and this is where a challenge study comes in because we, well, in theory, we could actually attempt to assess transmission between humans, um, but what the aim with this study will be is to use the viral loads within the nose um, to establish, uh, to estimate what the uh, chances that somebody would be infectious. Um, so what that means is that through this study, um, a group of people will be vaccinated um, with the investigational vaccine and then subsequently challenged um, and the viral loads will be measured and compared between either placebo, no vaccination, or with the current vaccines which are in use. There is a second longer term aim with this consortium, um, which connects in, again, with what Bridget was saying, in that need for coordination. Um, so this is uh, going to be a network of sites, um, UK, uh, Vaccinopolis, and Singapore. And the aim is that by establishing this network, we can do future studies with COVID, but that we're also prepared for a future pandemic um, and then potentially being able to respond to that pandemic with a challenge study within a meaningful time frame um, to help develop vaccines or treatments. So now moving on a bit more specifically with the Delta study. Um, so we, I gave this overview for the COVID-001 uh, study, uh, and it's very similar here for the Delta study as well. So we have a pre-screening and screening phase. Uh, pre-screening, we, um, volunteers will sign a consent form and we'll collect a blood sample to assess their antibody levels against Delta. Um, and then those individuals who appear to be suitable uh, and who are agreeable will progress to the screening phase where um, they would uh, uh, complete the full informed consent process. Um, and then there will be quite detailed uh, medical investigations to confirm that they are otherwise healthy. So this is excluding people based on pre-existing medical conditions as well as doing additional medical tests such as chest x-rays, um, bloods, spirometry, ECG and so on to confirm that they are currently healthy or appear to be currently healthy. Um, they would then be, uh, assuming they pass that phase, um, they would then be admitted to the quarantine unit which is one of our uh, wards at NCID, uh, one of the wards which is not currently in uh, medical use um, for patients, um, so we're not um, causing any problems with resources within NCID. Um, they'll be admitted, they'll be challenged with the virus and then stay in quarantine, um, single person quarantine, uh, until they're no longer infectious. And then we'll follow them up for one year afterwards um, to assess their uh, uh, immune changes afterwards. Um, picture here on the left is what the rooms will look like within NCID. So this is a standard uh, negative pressure room um, at NCID on the uh, negative pressure wards. Um, so on the left there, there's a, a toilet. Um, there's a nice view out the window over the centre of Singapore. Um, similar to here, actually, about the, the height level. It's quite a nice view. And then on the right is what the inoculation procedure looks like. Um, so a participant lies down. Um, and then using a pipette, a couple of drops of the virus are instilled um, within the, both sides of the nostrils. Um, and part of the aim with this, the way of doing it like this, is so that the virus is only instilled in the nose. So we don't want to cause pneumonia. Um, so we don't want the virus being inhaled uh, or going into the lower airways where the risk is greater. Um, again, as Shabana mentioned, this is really an infection model, not a disease model. We do expect people to experience symptoms, but these should be limited to mild upper respiratory tract symptoms, um, not a pneumonia. And the other way that we help to ensure that this is not a severe infection is by screening people very carefully. Um, so I've gone through this here um, already. It's adults aged between 21 to 30. Um, people who have been vaccinated, we will not be excluding people if they've been pre previously infected, um, uh, though it's likely that their antibody levels may be quite high if the infection was recent. Um, and then for the exclusion, it really takes out anybody with any um, medical history at all. Um, and just to mention here, part of this discussion will also talk about pregnancy 
Um, so we will be excluding people who are pregnant or who have plans to get pregnant. Um, there is no effects from, as far as we know really, of having COVID during pregnancy on the baby. Um, but to be safe, we exclude anyone um, who is thinking about pregnant, getting pregnant over the next year. If they did happen to get pregnant, then we would continue to follow them up um, until the, they have delivered. Here's the plan subject to reimbursement, um, which we came to partially based on the survey that uh, uh, Sydney Ray helped to, to conduct, um, and actually is quite similar to the reimbursement um, which Imperial College are providing to their subjects as well, to their participants, uh, and is very similar to what is used for phase one studies in healthy volunteers in Singapore by those uh, inpatient requirement as well. So it's about uh, $300 per day for that quarantine um, period, um, and then uh, additional um, reimbursements for each outpatient visit as well. So in total, about six thousand um, dollars. I think it's four thousand pounds is what the imperial is what imperial are um, giving to their participants. Confirming that someone's no longer infectious is important for reducing that risk to society, particularly when we're inoculating people with a variant which is no longer circulating in the community. Um, uh, Culturing SARS-CoV-2 takes a very long time, particularly to really confirm that there is, um, that a culture is negative. That can take several weeks. Um, so the way that this will be done for this study and what has been done for the previous studies um, is a uh, overnight culture assay, um, which then uses immunofluorescence to um, determine that there is no virus uh, uh, present. Um, and um, that will also be correlated with viral load results and with um, ART results as well. Uh, there is, of course, many, many study procedures which are being conducted by participants. Um, the blood donation is around about 800 milliliters over the whole study. Um, there will be intensive and the best scientific analysis of the samples that we can do. And the team which I list here on the right, we've all been working together throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we will be using these samples um, and comparing them with the thousands of other samples that we've collected from people who have had natural infection um, so that we can um, build, uh, so that we can get the best scientific outcomes from this study. Um, and uh, the types of studies that we do are very similar to what the UK has done or will be doing. Um, perhaps our only minor difference is in terms of the aerosol collection. So we have a G2 machine um, which is a machine where people will place their head inside a cone um, and they will speak and sing into that cone uh, and it collects the aerosol um, and gives us a best measurement of what the chances that somebody um, is infectious through the airborne route. Um, the UK studies so far have been using um, sort of air collectors which uh, hang by the side of the patient. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Barney. Um, so our, our final speaker is um, Ms. Uh, Sum Sin Wei, who was a former research fellow at uh, NCID and is, uh, works in engagement with uh, general practitioners and family physicians at NTU. Uh, over to you. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share about the public perspectives of uh, challenge studies in Singapore. This has been mentioned multiple times this morning. I'm not going to uh, go into details of this. But what I want to uh, bring to your attention is one of the eight criteria that was mentioned in this uh, WHO ethical um, con uh, guidance on the ethical conduct of human challenge study is the consultation and engagement with the public. And also the mention of proportionate payment uh, to participants in this um, article, in the ethical framework for the same type of study. So we conducted uh, a survey last year. Um, 
It's a cross-sectional descriptive survey. Uh, we aim to explore the public's knowledge and attitudes towards human challenge studies here in Singapore and also to understand the expected reimbursement. And data was collected between February and August by using a self-administered questionnaire that was adapted from two previous studies and we had made modification to the questions to suit the local context in Singapore. In total, we collected 612 responses and our respondents were mainly from the Health Opinions Panel Singapore and also uh, from National Centre for Infectious Diseases. The HOPS panel is an online research panel that is operated by the Centre for Biomedical Ethics in NUS and is approved for public health and ethics research. These are the characteristics of uh, our respondents. We had slightly more female than male, majority were Chinese, and the mean age was uh, 46.6 years. Close to 60% were educated to university degree or above. Similarly, close to 60% reported full-time employment, and the model annual income reported was between 20 to 60,000 in Sing dollars. So now let's look at what we found from the survey. In terms of awareness, the first question that we asked in our questionnaire was, uh, have you read, seen, or heard anything about the idea of a human challenge study? 90% said yes to this question, and 72% said no. Among those who responded yes, there was a follow-up question. Where have you read, seen, or heard about human challenge study with coronavirus? 39% reported news or media coverage as their main source of information, followed by 34% from social media. In terms of public acceptability, we showed the respondents a short video clip of uh, explaining what a human challenge study with coronavirus is and asked whether they are agreeable that such a study to take place in Singapore. More than 60% uh, agreed that this study should take place in Singapore, while 25% were neutral about it. This response was uh, supported by two other questions appeared later in the survey. More than 60% agreed that they would be comfortable uh, with the study happening in Singapore, and also because vaccines and treatments are already available for such infections. So in our survey, we had a series of statements uh, reflecting different opinions on human challenge studies. And we asked the respondents to indicate how much they agree or disagree with the statements on a seven point like Kurt scale. In general, we found that the public trusts the scientists and research ethic committees to make the right decision on whether a human challenge study with coronavirus should take place in Singapore. And the level of acceptability might be attributable to the perceived risks or potential benefits from the study. Many believe that the study could save lives, but there was also a considerable amount worried that it would involve unnecessary health risks to the volunteers. And the public also expect a reasonable scientific justification where the benefits outweigh the risk in order for the study to go ahead in Singapore. And as a matter of participation, there was a strong agreement that it should be up to an individual to decide whether the potential risks to them are acceptable enough for them to take part in the study. And more than 90% agreed they should be paid for the risk. We also asked the respondents to relate their personal feelings to participation in the study. We actually had 37% of our respondents considered volunteering, and about half would not want their family members to volunteer. And the motivation to take part in the study could be multifaceted, coming from internal and external factors. Doing something positive to help research, and also accepting uncertain risks, 
for the benefits of others, and the positive experiences from their previous encounter with research could also be a potential motivation for them to take part in research again. However, there are also other barriers or problems. 87% worried about the risk of developing severe illness by participating in the study, and more than half identified the potential negative impact on physical and mental health as the top potential problems in a scenario where they are required to stay in an isolation unit for 14 days. Other barriers included separation from household, work commitments, caring responsibilities, and their social life being affected. There were other factors or aspects that worth uh, taking a closer look for us to understand the decision-making process of these volunteers. Being part of research could potentially help people and they would want to fully understand all the risks as far as they are known. And also the involvement of others, uh, like reflected here, 82% would want to discuss with their close ones before making a decision. And offering payment is a very common and long-standing practice in research. These are some of the published work or articles uh, discussing about the matter. As mentioned earlier by other speakers, uh, there are ethical concerns surrounding this, uh, this topic. For example, giving a large amount might, uh, some might argue that uh, it is a form of undue inducement to the participants. But on the other hand, giving insufficient amount might bring about uh, the issue of exploitation. And the payment structure based on different models. The reimbursement model uh, to cover for the expenses incurred to the participants in expenses such as uh, food, lodging, transportation, and so on. The wage payment model, which is to compensate for their time and effort to take part in the study. The appreciation model serves as a token of appreciation at the conclusion of a study and also the market model, which was also mentioned earlier, where the amount is determined by the supply and demand. And the three rationales for payment included reimbursement, compensation, and also incentive to in incentivize the participants to take part and to complete the study. And payment for risk model was suggested in recent years for human challenge studies to account for the risk involved to participants. In our survey, we also asked the respondents on their opinions on uh, the issue of payment to research participants. 85% of our respondents actually disagreed that research participants should never be paid or reimbursement for their involvement in a research study. And subsequently, on the premise of research participants should be paid, 44% agreed that the payment should aim to, reimbursement, to reimburse the participant for their time and travel expenses. 23% agreed that the hourly rate of payment should be determined by what other unskilled laborers are paid, but no extra money should be given for the risk involved. But 67% agreed that extra money should be given depending on the risk involved in the study. And we found 69% of our respondents actually were acceptable to the market model where the amount is determined by the demand and supply of participants and how quickly the recruitment needs to occur. We also asked the respondents to rank the importance of different payment determinants. So as shown on this slide, risk of serious side effects is at the top of the list, followed by in descending order, the pain involved in the trial, the time required for participation, the number of invasive procedures involved, the inconvenience caused to the participants, and also the number of non-invasive procedures. So some of the take-home messages from our study. 
Um, is there a need to increase uh, public awareness and understanding? And having familiarity, uh, confidence and trust might potentially enhance participation. And clear communication is very important. By having transparency and also um, informing the participants of all the known risks so that they could make an informed decision uh, whether to take part in such study or not. And as much as possible, we should try to reduce the barriers to participation. And also we might want to rethink the financial reimbursement framework or perhaps come up with a guidance uh, for the context in Singapore. So before I end my presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my study team for their contribution. And that's all I have today. Misinformation and disinformation. What impact do you expect that to have on such studies now and in the future? I think um, so. From talking with the with the London team, uh, there have been certainly some um, concerns on social media. Um, about the human challenge study and related to misinformation. So misunderstanding about what the study involves or misunderstanding about what the risks of it are. Um, and uh, this, is, this is something this has been useful experience for us to understand um, what to do in Singapore. I think here there is less um, uh, issues with misinformation. Um, so as other studies have shown, there's strong trust in the government and the government has given clear messaging about um, the importance of vaccination, for example, um, for COVID. Um, the, we, um, we do intend to make sure that participants, when they um, sign up to join the study, um, we'll have very clear information about what we intend to do um, and they will be given multiple opportunities to decide whether they want to proceed with the study. Um, so we have the pre-screening phase, the screening phase, the pre-inoculation quarantine phase and then inoculation. And we will have a continuous process of discussion with the participant to make sure that we understand what their concerns are um, and make sure that they are always happy to proceed with the next step of the study. Um, um, yeah, the, from the long COVID point of view, I think that is probably the biggest concern with this study um, or with the human challenge study is the knowledge about long COVID um, remains incomplete. Um, the reassurance that we can give participants is that long COVID is much less common um, after um, in seropositive people, i.e. in people who have been previously vaccinated or if people have already had COVID. Um, and so the people who are being selected for participation in this study will have a very low risk of long COVID. Um, I run the long COVID clinic at NCID and so have experience of uh, managing patients with long COVID um, and will also use that to help um, reassure participants that their risk of it is very low and if they were to develop persistent symptoms that we will continue to provide medical care at no expense to them so they will be fully insured um, for any consequences of um, their participation in the study. Maybe the choice of uh, what channel of communication uh, we need to consider uh, which channel to use for an effective communication with the public. Thank you. Uh, other, other questions? Well, I, I guess, um, Barney, maybe I will kind of put the sort of results from the last excellent presentation. I was quite struck with the support of the Singaporean public for um, paying people for the risks that they were exposed to and, and paying them for the, for the pain and so on. 
Um, do, do you think there is a sort of disconnection between, particularly going back to Jake and, and, and his, his willingness to take part and the, the willingness to take on risks and you know, the, the issues of payment, do you think there's a disconnect between the ethics review process and concern with the, what matters to the public and participants in, in your experience? Do you, think, do you think that we are applying the right set of standards to, to this kind of research? Thank you. Uh, to an extent, I hope so, if that makes. Uh, I, I mean, uh, we've not started screening yet. And so I, I, when, we, yeah, when the rubber hits the road, when we actually have participants, we hope, coming to us who are interested in participating. Um, I, well, I hope there will be participants who are interested in participating and who will not see the amount that they're being reimbursed either as too much or an inducement or not being enough and that it sits in the right place. Um, uh, I think how much we reimburse um, is an interesting question, and I think is um, it's it's not we make up these sort of random numbers sometimes. I feel for, for this is for low risk studies where we're outpatients. We we have these sort of generic amounts that we'll give fifty dollars for a visit where we're collecting blood, or hundred dollars where we're giving. Uh, where somebody is coming and giving it blood and we state in the consent form or to the IRB that this is reimbursement for um, travel. I mean, it doesn't cost $100 to take a taxi to and from NCID most of the time. So then there's some, we may also say that there's some reimbursement for inconvenience. Um, and then you're starting to move into some sort of payment already. We're just not using that word. Um, and with other studies, we will give a um, thank you at the end. Um, so there may be progressive sort of payments, people receive their reimbursement each time they come, and then at the end they receive a larger amount um, as a thank you, which is to some extent a payment as well. Um, so I think, our, I think there is a disconnect between how we phrase it in the consent form um, and how, and that has been adjusted to, um, to meet the expectations of the ethics committees. Um, but the participant, when they sign the consent form, they're told you will get this amount of money for participating in the research. And so how they see that then is different. And many people do participate in research because they get $50 or $100 for a visit. And that's quite, if it's not too inconvenient for them, um, it's a, it's a um, they, they, it's, for some participants, that is a reasonable reimbursement for their time. Good to have um, the data from the public um, so that it can uh, be brought up during discussion with the party members to align the expectation from both the perspective of public participants versus um, the study team or the party members. Uh, Owen. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to follow up on this um, the payment question. Um, I mean, as, as you might be aware, the Bioethics Advisory Committee and its, you know, um, latest draft, uh, the latest uh, guidelines, you know, have, have a recommendation against payment uh, that would constitute an inducement. Um, and so, the, you know, the standard is, therefore, you know, the payment is made on the basis of time and convenience instead. Um, and, you know, I, I see the, the uh, for this study, $300 a day, which is roughly in line with, with other, other studies, it seems like it's not risk sensitive, right? It wasn't increased, it was, it was in line with our studies of high risk and low risk and similar risk levels. So it looks like it was not a payment for risk model or a market model for that matter for the, for the challenge study. Um, but I was wondering whether, um, is, is there therefore, is there a need or a need to revisit the BAC guidelines in light of this uh, to sort of relax that, that guideline? Or is, is it actually, is there enough flexibility already within the concept of time and inconvenience? And as you say, it's always, you know, always a bit, you know, how do we exactly pick this number? Um, we're already a bit flexible on that. Um, yeah, so is, it, is the current system kind of adequate enough flexibility or should we revisit kind of underlying guidelines and standards uh, to allow in line with public expectations in Singapore um, possibility of payment for risk or maybe even a market model. I, uh, thanks. I, can I say yes? Uh, <laughs> so I think, I think the risk with this study is low. So yes, there's no additional payment for risk, but the procedures that we participate, that participants will undergo are standard um, nasal swabs, um, blood draws. We don't do anything more invasive where the risks may be higher, such as bronchoscopy, which has been discussed about with um, similar challenge studies or 
perhaps say a bone marrow aspiration, something where there, there, where there are more invasive procedures, certainly more uh, discomfort and potentially higher risk. And what would be the appropriate amount to reimburse a participant? I don't know. Um, so, I mean, he, 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 if you consider that he's effectively paying people the same as people were paid in the imperial model, where the risks would have been higher at that point, uh, so actually it's a, it's, it's a more generous payment because there's a lower risk taking part today than there was when the imperial... So, you know, it, it, they are paying quite generously here considering the risks. But I wanted to ask you a question about the elephant in, in the room with challenge studies that really only... Peter has, has given an answer to, and that is, it, I mean, at the moment, the sort of thing that you're doing is, is, I think, very uncontroversial. But one of the main points of doing this is to prepare for the next pandemic, um, which there surely will be. And, and COVID was a very puny pandemic in terms of what, what is possible. And then the question is, how great a risk are we going to allow people to take? The, the, the kind of elephant in the room for challenge studies is that nobody has a way of thinking of fleshing out this, well, what is a reasonable cost-benefit ratio? What level of pu public benefit justifies this level of risk for the imperial challenge study? It was just taken, plucked out of the air as the risks of everyday life. Uh, and, and tethered to that probability. Now, Peter has a model that says you can compare it to the risks that healthcare workers are taking. Um, but somebody might say, well, you know, you, if we allow people to attempt to climb Mount Everest, you know, in adverse conditions and, you know, have a 20% chance of dying, uh, why don't we allow people to take any risk as long as they're well informed? And, and apart from this parity model that, that Peter has suggested, Nobody has a way of thinking about the risk. So the, the report that Bridget mentioned has a very elaborate and complicated approach to that. But I'm wondering, Barney, if I can ask you, you know, when the next pandemic comes, um, you know, and it's, say, it's, say it's bird flu and it's, 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 it's not killing people who are 80, it's killing, you know, um, people between 10 and 30 with a sort of a rate of 14%. Um, what, what's going to be your approach to, or how should we think about the level of risk that the, the and you will have people from one day sooner who will be prepared to volunteer, you know, when the, the chance is perhaps 14% of them dying. So what, how, how should we think about the risk um, when we face, you know, a bigger challenge than COVID-19? Wow. Well, I... I think I think that's very difficult to answer, isn't it? It's, <laughs> well, you're, you're the man at the front. You're, you're, you're going to be designing. <laughs> the um, I, th I mean to answer it from say from the other side in terms of what risk would I feel happy participants taking? So I I, I don't know whether participants would be willing to take on a trial where there is say I mean even not death but say a risk of serious illness of one percent. I don't know if I would feel happy with that. Um, and um, I, yeah, I, I, at the moment I feel, so I feel very comfortable with doing a COVID challenge study now. It's, as you say, it's not controversial. It's in, in previously vaccinated or infected people. I, I know the risks are gonna be very low. I mean, they, they can never be zero, but they're going to be very low. I, I don't know how I even would have felt with a zero negative study, to be honest. Um, perhaps once I have some experience of uh, inoculating or conducting a human challenge study, um, I will feel differently. Um, yeah. What do you think? Setting a ceiling for risk. There are many stakeholders in um, deciding whether a human challenge study should, uh, should be conducted. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very difficult question to feel, but, um, it's, it's a combination of all factors and also um, the way of conducting the study and what considered acceptable to um, the scientists or the study team might not be what um, being considered acceptable to the public. So. Um, Pre-study, it's important to get the consultation with the public 
this is also uh, maybe the key to the success of a study. So if um, you're asking me what's the first ceiling, <laughs> I don't have an answer for that, but it's important to get the opinions and input from all stakeholders. Thanks, everybody. That was a great uh, line of presentations. I'd like to pick up, if I may, on the points that have been made about the attitudinal data and the public view on these things. Uh, as Julian said at the start, when we look at the, the data from the public around payment, it seems a lot more sophisticated, their reasoning, than you often hear from the bioethics community or the IRBs even. But I'm struck by the original first data source that you presented, which showed us, I think, that there's a huge range of views about the acceptability of challenge studies in Singapore. So there certainly isn't the public mandate to be doing them, and it looks like a significant minority, if not 50%, think it's, they shouldn't be done at all. Now, in light of that data, how should we proceed? Because it seems like the panel, and indeed myself, and I'm sure many other people here, think that the ethical case for challenge studies is made. It's strong, it's clear cut. Do we just set that to one side and say those people are mistaken in their ethical judgments, or do we use it simply for educational purposes? Um, I think uh, it is important to get uh, the comments from everyone and also from the minority. Perhaps uh, having a qualitative study to, to interview those with uh, uh, at the opposite side of um, of this and and see what are their comments on this. I would, I, I, obviously, we've looked at that data and sort of pondered about it, and I partially wonder. And this is where a qualitative study may be useful: is whether the phrasing of that initial of that question, should this study be done, um, may. I mean, maybe I'm being biased, but maybe it pushes some people towards disagreeing, because maybe they're saying, do we really need it now? COVID is over, we've got vaccines, we've got treatments, there's not a requirement for a challenge study. Um, and yeah, as Sam mentioned, I, I, think it's, I think it's some more qualitative research to understand in more detail the um, thinking behind people, whether there truly is an objection and a significant number of people who object to the idea of a challenge study, understand why, understand if that can be um, that opinion can be changed. Um, and then community engagement, um, which is um, uh, which is something that we need to do for more of our research in general, and I think not just the challenge studies. Hi. Um, so I'd like to follow up on um, Julian's question about how much risk we're prepared to take, right? So far, everybody's been describing a controlled environment. Um, so as a researcher, you decide that this is a risk that you're going to um, set up in the study and so on. But what about an uncontrolled scenario? So say if a new pandemic, like what Julian said, um, nobody's uh, inoculated against it, 14% um, mortality and so on. And you have a cruise ship who everybody on, on board is um, possibly uh, exposed uh, a, is, there, is it morally wrong to use the cruise ship as a challenge trial? And, I mean, it's, everybody is really at risk. So it's really there. Is there anything morally wrong with it? And B, is anything scientifically problematic with it? Because now it's all uncontrolled. The factors, in, it's all very messy. But, so is there any scientific value in, in monitoring this cruise ship? Of course, we can't take into account. There's no time to do a public uh, poll and see if people are acceptable with it. If you want to do it, you can do it, you can run it right away. Um, if, I, in terms of, if I can answer, I think, uh, a good question. I, in terms of whether it's morally acceptable, I suppose it depends whether we can conduct a study that is that people can consent. So, so long as people can consent to whatever is being undertaken and that study has been approved by RBs and considered um, the risks are acceptable, then we can. And there were good studies done on the cruise ships early in the pandemic. Um, we conducted a study on um, people returning in a flight from Wuhan. Um, so people who have been quarantined, they've been exposed because there was someone on the flight who had COVID uh, and then looking at the rates of transmission and looking at symptomatic infection as well. 
uh, versus asymptomatic infection. Um, the difference, I suppose, um, why challenge studies remain useful now as well um, is being able to study that pre-symptomatic period and knowing precisely when somebody was infected and then all the events that occur from then until symptoms develop or until the virus is detected because that's the bit that we can never do and never understand properly in an uncontrolled natural infection uh, and, uh, and so that's the bit where it's extremely valuable uh, in addition to the development of vaccines or, or treatments. Thank you. Thanks. Just occurred to me since money came up, um, what happens to people who are on health insurance policies and that can they actually give consent and then after that, if they fall ill, does that have an impact on them because they did give informed consent? Uh, uh, for for the challenge study it will be conducting, um, they will be covered by the National Clinical Trial Insurance, so it does not cause any issues with their current health insurance. If there were medical bills related to their participation in the study, they will be covered by NCID and by the National Clinical Trial Insurance, so it will be separate. If they have a medical condition unrelated to their participation in the study, that would then be covered by their regular insurance. Um, this, of course, the other medical issue that we will be doing um, uh, whole genome sequencing of participants with, and that can have implications for their insurance cover. So from that point of view, and they will obviously be, participants will be counseled on that um, and they will you know, consent for that to happen. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Singapore system, but I seem to remember somebody raising this as an issue for participation in trials and, and maybe it went something like this. So you take part in, in, in this study and um, several months later you have a heart attack. Um, and it, it's not clear whether the heart attack was the result of the trial participation or not. You, I think you can end up in a very kind of, in, in, no, in no man's land where uh, <laughs> maybe your insurance doesn't cover it or it costs you a lot of money and, and maybe the clinical trials insurance, you know, isn't willing to sort of say this isn't related to the trial. Uh, do you see that sort of thing as a problem and do you think there should be a, a kind of no-fault compensation scheme for a certain period after uh, clinical research so patients don't end up in this no-man's land? For Singapore, yes. I, I, and I think that's how it would work out. So um, we have, we'll have a small number of participants who will get to know very well. Um, and the way the insurance is not um, upfront, if that makes sense. So it's not, it's not like um, being, in the US at least as I understand it, where you require pure authorization, um, even when you're admitted um, in an emergency situation. Um, the medical bills would be covered by the hospital, and it's the hospital who then get the insurance to then cover the medical bill. Uh, and I think we would have a low threshold so if it could have been related to COVID, then we would um, make sure that it's covered by the insurance and so not the participants hanging. Of course, very, very low chances would happen. But uh, the, the other bit, though, just as a would be, and where it may be complicated, would be for other studies such as a hepatitis C challenge study, or I mean, not a HIV challenge study, but a HIV vaccine study where people then have positive antibody tests afterwards, more HIV or hepatitis C. And that could have longer term implications, um, which would be complicated with COVID. Obviously, the concerns there. Thanks. Um, take a second bite of the apple. Um, I wanted to go back to the context of a, a pan, uh, early pandemic um, use of challenge studies and thinking about going forward for the next big one, which you know uh, sooner or later is probably going to hit. Um, you know, early on in the COVID pandemic, some of us were very enthusiastic about the possibility of challenge studies to accelerate vaccine development. So the thought was at that time, you know, previously vaccine developments were, you know, eight, five, five ten years, and, and that's just an unacceptable timeline, and the thought was that challenge studies could accelerate that. But of course, one of the great uh, innovations of the COVID-19 pandemic was the very rapid uh, development of vaccines uh, without the use of a challenge study in the course of a year. 
um, and, 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 and trialing them very quickly um, in the field uh, and uh, demonstrating effectiveness. Whereas um, it was clear that to get a challenge study off, off the ground, it takes a long time to, as I understand, one of the biggest barriers is isolating that, that, that strain for use in, in the challenge trial. And even today, the one uh, for Singapore is the Delta strain, which is no longer right, the dominant strain. That's just because of that, that time gap, as I understand it. Um, so, you know, if that is really the case, if it's going to be this really big time gap and we have other mechanisms to get vaccine developments done rapidly without the use of without waiting for a challenge study to be ready, um, it is actually, is the challenge study only really suitable in the medium term, whereas we should be looking towards other mechanisms um, to get a vaccine into people's arms in the midst of a deadly pandemic uh, the next time. Over. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the, partially the SEPI grant that um, I, I mentioned, the, the aim of that is to streamline that process in terms of developing a challenge agent and so being able to move into challenge studies much quicker um, from multiple point of views, uh, both scientific, ethical, as well as the, the challenge agent. Um, I suppose whether it would be required for a future pandemic, whether a mRNA vaccine, for example, which in theory could be developed relatively quickly, and if we already have a licensed seasonal influenza mRNA vaccine, or if it was a coronavirus and it was, we could modify what was currently available, um, and that was providing similar good protection against severe illness, um, then that motivation for a challenge study may be weaker. Uh, as on the other hand, so our aim with, with the um, challenge study is to test mucosal vaccines, which is a limitation uh, of current vaccines for COVID, for influenza and other respiratory viruses as well in terms of not providing that protection against infection and that protection against transmission. Um, I suppose an interesting question also would be if we had had a challenge study available in 2020, um, how that may have changed some of the uh, public perception of the mRNA vaccines and the safety of them. Um, perhaps it would have helped, I don't know. Any last minute questions? Oh, oh sorry. Hi. Um, sorry, I don't know where to stand. Um, I just have a question about the ethics of um, kind of any manipulations or influences of the public narrative when it comes to um, um, changing how the public acceptance on these um, challenge trials. Because if we talk about payment schemes as potentials for undue um, inducement that we should also uh, maybe bring in the perspective of um, whether any kind of uh, perhaps advertisement or marketing or kind of um, uh, ideas there brought in or maybe um, influences of um, uh, the general uh, political environment that could influence the kind of acceptance towards these challenge trials um, and what you think of that as well. I guess publicity is very important. And also, um, like I mentioned earlier, the channel of communication. Uh, if uh, you all can remember uh, at the early stage of COVID-19, um, we had a lot of um, circulation of um, uh, what we can call that misinformation, um, maybe in social media space. Yep, so uh, I guess um, on that aspect, we need to uh, be very careful but at the same time, we need to have some sort of education to the public to, to let them know um, that uh, we have this uh, safety in, in place. What are the risk mitigation strategies by uh, the other stakeholders and also uh, the approvals from RB and, and what are the evidence that support the conduct of uh, this kind of study? If, uh, to follow on what Sam said, so the for specific studies, of course, there is uh, IRB approval of any material that is patient-facing. So if we have advertisements, or we will have advertisements for um, the Sinkoff study, um, they have been approved by the IRB um, before they're um, shown to patients so that they are fair and accurate in terms of the representation of the study. Um, for more broader about the advocacy of challenge studies, um, obviously, everyone comes with their own viewpoint. Um, I think, from my point of view, I hope that we can have a diversity of voices um, so that this is not just 
me as a person who is hoping to conduct a challenge study, um, but other people within um, academia or within government who can um, uh, advocate and explain why these studies are required. Um, and as Jake mentioned, also um, people who have experience of challenge studies. So the, the people who join our studies, we, we hope that we, um, uh, that they will be um, able to share their experience um, to other people. Um, and so we then have that, that full sort of range of um, people saying um, why these studies are necessary, um, how they're conducted, why they're, why they're safe and why they need to be done. Um, and we don't just have one person who's sort of sitting there saying, we should do this, believe me, please. Thank you. Okay. One more question, I think. I just had a quick question, um, partly scientific and partly normative. I was wondering on the scientific side whether there were any limitations to challenge studies that came from restricting the individuals that could take part to very you know, healthy, no comorbidities individuals. And I suppose on the normative side, whether you thought there was any in-principle reason why you know, someone, say, in the case of COVID, slightly older or with, with comorbidities, who said, look, I'm very aware of these risks, but I think it would be uh, worthwhile for me to take part, especially if that got useful findings for similar patients in a similar situation to mine. Whether you think there's any in-principle reason why they shouldn't be able to take part in challenge studies. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and of much debate. How do we make sure that the challenge infection is actually representative of natural infection? Um, we've been very cautious with the Delta study in terms of only enrolling people who have absolutely you no know, uh, comorbidities, who don't even have a family history of severe COVID or unexpected severe COVID. Um, but the people who get severe COVID are much older and do have comorbidities. And so we're gonna to have to extrapolate from this group to understand what's happening in, um, in people who are at risk of severe illness. Um, so that, that is definitely a limitation of human challenge studies. I, I think similar to um, their role in terms of vaccine development, um, they are a starting point. So they can give us the right information at the beginning to then understand the wealth of other data better. Um, but yes, they can't, they can't cover everything. So for vaccines, they, we would do a challenge study and then say, good, we can now give everybody that vaccine. We can say, this is the vaccine that should progress to larger phase trials. Um, and so the data that we, similarly the data that we get from a challenge infection, we can then use it to say, this is the data we have from a natural infection. Um, you know, this, is, this is why it's like this. Okay, I think we should um, wrap things up. I think there's some, some, something about uh, wrap up um, and feedback form, which the feedback form is very important. It's up there. That's extremely most important thing that you do today. Um, so I might just wrap up. We actually, the whole of vaccination is the result of uh, Edward Jenner's challenge study of James Phipps, a sort of a, a small boy um, that he deliberately infected. Uh, so in challenge studies have been extremely important in medicine and I think they're becoming rediscovered in the last decade or a couple of decades uh, as an important part of the armamentarium. But what I've learned today is that there, I mean, I personally think it was a, a, a failure um, in the pandemic not to have utilised challenge studies earlier, but we heard that it was the result of, of getting... Um, high-grade virus and having the facilities to be able to do that research. Uh, and I think what I've learned is there needs to be an enormous coordination to set up facilities such as Singapore has done and to be prepared for the future and to involve the public and other stakeholders quickly because, um, you know, in medicine, time is lives. Uh, you know, we, it was incredible to get a vaccine within a year of the pandemic, but you know, as, as Peter said, you know, his estimate is 20,000 lives were lost each day. You delayed that and one day sooner when I was working with them at the beginning of the pandemic said it was 5,000 lives, but whatever number it is, it's a lot. Uh, and there's an ethical obligation to move as quickly as possible. So I think what's happening in Singapore is an incredibly important first step. But, you know, as we've seen, this requires ethics um, and we don't have a way of thinking about how to deal with greater than V 
very minimal risk um, at the moment. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges as we approach the future to think about how we, we embrace um, higher risk studies uh, and, and what would be justifiable. What, what I can tell you from uh, my experience of the pandemic is um, there's very little real ethical expertise that goes into this decision making. I think the, the ethicist on the, the sort of pandemic committee um, actually doesn't have any sort of formal ethical qualifications. And the only person I know that was involved was, was Mike Parker through the SAGE committee. But um, often the, the level of ethical expertise um, that goes into these deliberations of people who, like Peter, has spent his life studying. I'm not sure if Peter's been on any of these committees. I certainly haven't. And my colleague, Dominic Wilkinson, who's a professor of medical ethics and a practising doctor, has never been involved in these decisions, is very minimal. And I think when you do involve people with a real ethics background and the public, often the, the needle tilts further towards permissiveness rather than obstruction. And I think often the, the limitations that's put on the research is, um, is, is, first of all, based on fear and often based on a fairly unsophisticated view of ethics. Um, but that's a topic for another talk. I think what I've taken away from the talk today is that we need to prepare, to coordinate, uh, and and to, to start going on this. So I'm, I'm very excited to see Singapore is one of the, the three major centres. It's interesting the US isn't in there, Vaccinopolis in Belgium, I've discovered, uh, and the UK, but uh, that's a great feather in Singapore's cap. Abani, do you want to say anything else as a sort of co-leader of this in sort of summary? Uh, no, apart from I agree completely. I, I, yeah, I'm really, obviously glad this is happening in Singapore and glad that we're Imperial College um, are, and Chris Chu um, have a guiding us basically so we're, we're we don't have the capacity or expertise at the moment we're developing that and that's only been possible because of um, because Imperial have uh, and Chris Chu has, has decided that they they are there to to develop other countries and develop other sites and develop us all as a network to share their protocols and their SOPs and not um, hoard them to themselves and say, we will do all this just ourselves um, and you just work out your own way. And so with that coordination uh, and with having these sites in multiple countries, um, I think that will change where we are for the next pandemic and hopefully will also change um, the role of human challenge studies um, for development of future vaccines so that they can really become a, a standard part of many um, of the development process um, for many different infections where a challenge study is appropriate. Uh, but yeah, if I may just say thank you very much for attending today. Um, uh, thank you to the um, organisers from the uh, NUS Centre of Biomedical Ethics and from NCID as well. So. Fionn and Kaini um, and Grayling and other people as well have all helped here. Uh, and thank you very much to all the speakers, uh, particularly those who have come over from overseas to join us today. I've really learned a lot by sitting here and uh, listening to all of the talks um, and uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it too. Okay, thank you.